Well, thank you very much. We are now 21 minutes late. Uh, so I am going to try to reduce my remarks to get you out of here by 2.15. Uh, but there are a few things and points that I would like to make. Uh, first of all, uh, as Senator Ferrioli said, the election felt like a route to me also, but probably not for the same reasons that he was referring to. I, um, I want to sincerely thank Duncan Wise and uh, John Carter and the rest of the group here that, that puts on this remarkable conference. And we've been doing this for 12 years now, if you think about it. Uh, political and labor and advocacy communities coming together uh, to find common ground around a common purpose, and that's to ensure that Oregon's economy is innovative and is resilient and that it lifts up the prospects of each and every person uh, in this state. And of course, the vehicle through which we deliver that, and I think one of the part of the glue that holds us together is in fact the Oregon Business Plan. And so, you know, it's got three primary goals, which is uh, job creation, uh, increasing income, and reducing poverty. And I want to take just a few minutes uh, this morning and talk about those goals, and I want to talk briefly about where we've been, a pretty incredible journey we've been on for the last four years, what still remains to be done, and then I want to take just a few minutes at the end and reflect a bit on the third goal uh, of, the Oregon, of the Oregon business plan. Um, you know, when we gathered here in December of 2010, it was a much different mood. Uh, we had a $3.5 billion budget deficit, we had high unemployment, we had a polarized state and a divided legislature, and a, and a pretty uncertain future. And I think a lot of you can probably remember what it felt like on the eve of the 2011 session uh, with those kinds of dawning challenges. But as John said in that inaugural address at the beginning of the 2011 session, I said that uh, our future would be shaped by the choices we make in the next six months and by the civility with which we deal with each other as we make the difficult structural changes needed to put Oregon on a more sustainable footing. And to me, one of the really remarkable aspects of the Oregon story is those legislative leaders and the rest of us took that to heart. Uh, and we took on uh, one of the largest per capita budget deficits in the nation and we erased it with collegiality we were rewarded when our credit rating was raised from AA to AA plus in the depths of the recession. We've actually exceeded our job creation objectives. Our goal is 25,000 jobs a year. In the last three, uh, four years, we've created over 132,000 jobs. That's an average of 33,000 jobs uh, each year. And I'm not going to go through the entire list of business accomplishments, but as you know, we have uh, gotten very substantial long-term investments in Oregon from some of our largest traded sector companies. We've got Daimler building its North American headquarters in Northeast Portland. We've got Garmin down in Salem. We've got Mastercraft in, uh, uh, out in Staten and Columbia Tissue in St. Helens, and the list goes on and on. We've done some really remarkable uh, things together, and I think that we should be very, uh, uh, very proud. Uh, of how we've changed the economic picture in this state over the last uh, four years. Uh, in addition to those economic successes, we've made some significant uh, transformational changes in both education and health care, which, if you recall, are key elements of the overall Oregon business plan. Uh, in, in, in education, which we talked about this morning, uh, we've essentially el eliminated the silos and are creating a, an educational continuum. And for the first time, we have a budget that focuses on kindergarten readiness and third grade reading, on high school and post-secondary completion, and on connecting uh, Oregon students to careers. And in our healthcare system, 95% of everybody in this state has health insurance coverage today. Tens of thousands of them for the very, very first time. Now, obviously, we still have a lot to do, and I want to take just a couple minutes and talk about the three key policy priorities that are reflected in this year's Oregon business plan. And the first one, of course, is this effort to uh, connect uh, uh, education to careers. And I think there is a hugely robust opportunity, uh, particularly for those high-wage and high-demand jobs that are going unfilled today. I mean, it is really a contradiction uh, when uh, employers are struggling to fill well-paying jobs in manufacturing, in technology occupations, and healthcare, uh, and unemployment and poverty remain especially high among young Oregonians and among communities of color. Uh, those of you who attended the session this morning recall the moving stories of, uh, of Derek Morales and, and, and Michelle Cantor, and again, that demonstrates the power and the potential of applied learning to pull young people through high school, to give them a reason to get that high school d diploma because they can see the connection to a good career, they can see a connection to a bright future. 
Those are very important investments, the CTE investments and the STEM investments. And so I'm counting on you, my, my first ask this morning, or this afternoon, I guess, is to help keep those investments in the budget. And to remember that the ability to take advantage of a STEM program or a CTE program is based on your early childhood experience and not dropping out before you get to high school. So those early learning investments are equally as important. The second thing I want to talk about is putting our natural resources to work. And this issue is directly related to the specific challenges facing many rural parts of our state. Those impressive numbers that I gave you show that we've done a good job lifting up the overall state economy, but the fact is that there are places in this state, particularly in rural Oregon, where people simply are facing uh, enormous uh, uh, challenges. So this budget approaches that in two ways. The first one is a significant investment of $200 million that's specifically targeted to provide opportunity in rural Oregon based on the recognition and the commitment that our economic recovery is not going to be either equal or complete until people in every region of the state have the opportunity to share in the benefits of a thriving economy. That includes resources to ensure that regional solution projects can be funded in every corner of the state. And there are five breakout sessions on regional solutions following this. And there are some amazing things going on in rural Oregon where they get the money and can use it themselves around their own priorities to lift up their own communities and their own economies. $50 million for water projects across the state. Uh, we've uh, doubled the funding for our forest collaboratives, which as you heard this morning are creating jobs in places like John Day and LeGrand. And we've recommended funding for both the Forest Science Research Center in Corvallis and the four-year campus for the Marine uh, Hatfield uh, Science Center uh, uh, down in Newport. Now, part of the problem is investment, and we're going to make those investments, and we need to hold those investments in the budget as well. But there's another problem that afflicts rural Oregon. You know, part of it is infrastructure, part of it is workforce, and we're moving to address those. But I think part of it is due to the fact that in many cases, our vision and our solution space for rural Oregon remains limited by this false choice about the environment versus the economy. Uh, and I think we can have both. I believe to the depths of my soul that we can have healthy, thriving rural economies and natural resource industries and healthy, thriving uh, natural environment. They're not mutually exclusive. And the problem is that today, and I think you heard it this morning, some of our best thinkers on the future of natural resource industries and innovation, which you heard here this morning, recognize that there are opportunities to make great strides for rural Oregon. But to do so, we've got to move beyond the battles of the past. We've got to create new alliances. We've got to create new coalitions. Uh, and to ask ourselves a very basic question. What do we want our natural resource industries in Oregon to look like 10 years from now? So we can use that as a guide to judge the actions and conflicts and fights that we have today. So I think we need a North Star for our natural resource industries so that we can help get beyond the conflicts and the false choices of the past and ensure that these industries are sunrise industries as we move into the second decade of the 21st century. And I think one of the places to start is Business Oregon's plan to begin to develop 10-year forward-looking roadmaps to chart a course for some of our most important industries, starting with agricultural and food. And I'm recommending today, and I've spoken to Sean Robbins, that we need to include wood products in that initial effort as well. I'm not going to say much on infrastructure. That's been covered pretty well, and I don't think I can uh, get as deeply into micro beers as Tammy Bainey, um, one of the reasons she is on the Transportation Commission, of course. Uh, but I do want to uh, <laughs> emphasize the, the, the importance of, of, uh, of this issue. You know, our strong multimodal transportation system has been one of our, our comparative advantages as we compete with other states and other nations for jobs and as we try to export, you know, the products from our family, uh, from our, far our farms and our forests and our factories. But today we are constrained in moving forward because of two primary sources, and both of them have been mentioned, but I want to emphasize them again. People are driving less. Cars are more fuel efficient. So the gas, the money rep generated by the gas tax is going down, which depletes and compromises the integrity of the state uh, highway fund. And most of that fund now is, is uh, taken up by maintenance and debt service and agency operation, leaving almost nothing for new projects. And the second concern is, is the federal concern. The future of the Federal Highway Trust Fund is very much uh, in doubt. It could go insolvent by July of this year, and that is a big deal because it accounts for 25% of ODOT's budget. 
So I am very strongly supportive of a transportation package moving through the 2015 legislature, and it's going to require a lift by all of us, but it's something that we can do in Oregon, and we need to do it in 2015. And there are three areas that we need to focus on. The first one is essentially maintaining and protecting our existing assets. We have invested tens of billions of dollars in our transportation system in Oregon, and we've got to make sure that we are able to uh, protect that. And as Tammy said, there are bridges today that require trucks to take devious detours that adds cost to Oregon uh, businesses, creates unanticipated congestion in rural towns, and simply is not uh, the way of the future. The second one is we know that we are uh, at risk of a Cascadia a subduction zone earthquake that would wreak havoc with our transportation system and we need to begin now to invest in bridge retrofitting and shoring up landslides to make the system more resilient so that it bounces back quicker uh, when uh, that, um, that event occurs. And the, th the third one is very, very important, and that's making sure that we have stable funding for multimodal transportation operations and connections that foster prosperity, that, that enhance mobility, uh, that improve safety and preserve livability. And certainly Connect Oregon and general funds have made a contribution to that, but they simply uh, are not sustainable. So you can count on me to do uh, all that I can to help support uh, a transportation package getting through the 2015 legislative session. Um, I want to just take a few moments here at the end and talk about something that may be less comfortable but I think is very, very important for all of us to consider, and that's the third pillar uh, of, the, uh, of the Oregon Business Plan, which is an attempt to reduce poverty to below 10% by 2020. And I want to make, make these comments and make sure you understand that I'm making these comments in the context and spirit of the theme of this leadership summit, which is in it together, a commitment to shared opportunity and prosperity. Now, I've talked a lot today, today, and we've all talked a lot today about the jobs we've created and about our economic recovery and about the rapid growth in the state economy. And at the same time, we've also acknowledged, and this is part of your document today, that, that unemployment and poverty remain stubbornly high in geographic pockets of the state, particularly in rural Oregon, and especially with young adults and in communities of color. So unemployment and poverty is not just a rural issue. You can find it a mile from where we're standing uh, today. And this leadership summit and the theme reflects, and I'll just take this as a quote, the recognition that we need to make sure that all citizens and all regions have an opportunity to achieve a greater share of prosperity, a greater share of prosperity. And I must tell you that I am proud to be part of an organization that's willing to ask those questions and make that commitment. And to make good on that commitment, you've come up with a three priority uh, points that you're built the, the, the agenda around today, connecting uh, education to careers, putting our natural resources to work, uh, and of course, modernizing our infrastructure. These are great initiatives, and I pledge to do everything I can uh, to make sure that we implement them. But even if we're successfully implementing all of those, even if we get funding for a transportation package, I don't think in the end of the day we're gonna succeed in giving all of our citizens and regions the opportunity to achieve a greater share of prosperity unless we have the courage and the honesty to address what I call the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is that the underlying structure of our economy, not just in Oregon, but in the United States of America, is changing and not entirely for the better. And that this recovery that we've talked about is actually leaving more and more of our fellow Oregonians behind. Indeed, I have to say that sometimes I feel a little bit disingenuous talking about economic recovery because I am sure that that term doesn't have much meaning for hundreds of thousands of people uh, in this state. So we measure our current economic recovery by two things, by the number of jobs we're creating and by the rate at which our state economy, our state GDP, wealth creation, is growing. And by those standards, we are doing really, really well. We have gain back all the jobs we lost during the recession. We've got more people working in Oregon now than at any time in our state's history. And judged by growth in our GDP, we had the fourth, uh, fifth fastest growing economy in the United States, state economy in 2011, and the fourth fastest in 2012. The question is, how does that translate into the well-being of our fellow citizens, their ability to feed their kids and, and, and meet their basic needs and take care of their families? And the answer is not very well. Um, it's not that we aren't, we aren't creating well-paying jobs, we are. We're just not creating them fast enough to replace the well-paying jobs that we lost during, during the Great Recession. 
And that's not something that's new, and I think we are all aware of it. If you look back to post-World War II, between 1945 and the mid-1970s, worker productivity increased by about 94%, uh, and um, um, uh, uh, excuse me, worker productivity increased 96% and wages about 94%. Between the mid-1970s and 2011, worker productivity increased 80% and wages increased about 10%. So I'm not saying that, there's, that this is anybody's fault, but I just want to point out the fact that our workers are more productive today than they've ever been before, but they're not actually sharing equitably in the wealth that they're creating. And it seems to me that that should trouble all of us, because one of the fundamental notions on which this nation was founded was that in America, hard work is actually rewarded with a better life. And yet, for a growing number of Oregonians, that's simply not the case. So in the midst of the economic recovery, we've got a growing number of people who are trapped in low-wage or part-time jobs on which you can't possibly support a family and no real hope uh, to move up. And, and I just find that troubling. It's, it's, it's not just unfair, but it creates divisions between us and makes it harder to bring us together as a community. And we're going to have to be a community if, for example, we want to fund transportation. So the point is, in addition to the top three priorities that you've laid out today, uh, we've also got to engage in a broader and more intentional discussion of this situation. And I know that that's been in the hearts and minds of a lot of you because a lot of you told me that. Private sector leaders, public se sector leaders, non-for-profit leaders have pointed to this as a shared challenge that we have to tackle together. And I think we can do that in Oregon. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I'm sure it's real complicated. Nobody, let alone me, has all the answers. But I think it's important that we start asking the right questions. The American novelist Thomas Pinchon once said in his book, Gravity's Rainbow, if they can get you to ask the wrong questions, you don't have to worry about the answers. If the only answers we ask, or the questions we ask are how fast is the state GDP growing and how many jobs are we creating, we don't have to worry about their quality, where they are, who's getting them, how much they pay, whether they're connected to upward career ladders or the environmental cost of creating them. You know that I'm totally supportive of the Oregon business plan have been and will continue to be. And I pledge to work side by side with you to deliver on each of those three priorities that you set out today. In return, I would ask that you engage with me in a serious conversation about the inherent contradiction between a rapidly growing economy and the increasingly desperate plight of hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens. And I just want to conclude by saying that this is not a conversation that's separate from the rest of what we're doing here today. I think it's foundational to it. An Oregon economy that moves some of us before, forward and leaves others of us behind slows progress for all of us. So I will just say that it seems to me that if we can erase one of the nation's largest per capita budget deficits with bipartisanship and without tearing our state apart, if we can pull off a three-day special session at which we raised taxes and stabilized the PERS system, again with bipartisan support and against the backdrop of the dysfunction and shutdown of the federal government, and if we can negotiate a stand down between business and labor of some very divisive ballot measures, then surely this isn't a reach too far in Oregon. So I hope you'll join me in that. Thank you very, very much.